We are studying a series of lessons on rock-solid faith, and we're studying these in order to strengthen our faith as we face an onslaught of humanistic ideology and humanistic influence in our culture that is undermining and really deliberately and intentionally seeking to destroy biblical truth. The truth that underpins our society that was at the founding of our nation and still in many ways is what helps to support and guide this nation though less and less as time goes by. The truth of the Word of God that is being attacked, that is being eroded, that is being rooted out in our society is fundamental to our relationship with God and with our Lord and Master Jesus Christ. So when we're talking about these things, we're talking about that which impacts our eternal destiny, whether our souls and the souls of others dwell in heaven or suffer in hell for all eternity. You know, there are people who deny the plain teaching of the Bible regarding creation and other biblical issues, other historical events found recorded in the Word of God. We see this, of course, in atheists, in agnostics, in those that we would describe as skeptics. And really, we expect that from them. We expect them to look at the Word of God, to look at what it says about creation, to look at what it says about different events that are recorded in the Word, and to say that those things don't exist, that those things are not real, that that is all simply made up, if you will. And the reason they want to do this is because they have to undermine anything related to God. If they will undermine those things, if they're successful at it, then that means that we are not accountable to God, that we do not answer to God. We don't have to respect or submit to the authority of God. So that's expected, to see the attacks and the denials from those who are unbelievers. But it's shocking that there are many so-called believers that deny the Word of God and what it teaches. There is a man by the name of Lee Struggle. He wrote a book that's called The Case for a Creator. And there's a lot of good information within that book. But he takes the position of the evolutionary time frame. He accepts the idea of a Big Bang. He just simply says, instead of it being a random event like an atheist, he says that God caused that Big Bang and that God guided evolution down through the millions and really billions of years. Also, there is a man by the name of Hill Roberts. He's a Christian and a NASA scientist. And in his material on Genesis and the time thing, he comes out as a militant advocate that the universe is 4.6 billion years old. He supports that idea. And he says that the Big Bang is the believer's friend and the atheist nemesis. He also denies the global flood that's recorded in Genesis chapter 7 and 8. Now these are people who are supposed to believe God, are supposed to believe in His Word. <coughs> And yet they deny what is written in that Word. You and I have to look at God's Word and let that be the foundation of our faith. Not scientific declarations. Not what scientists say about a particular issue. We don't filter our belief through what they discover in the lab or don't discover, or what they theorize in the classroom or in their offices. But we filter what they say through the Word of God. 
We use God's Word as a standard, as it says in John 17, 17, sanctify them by your truth. Your Word is truth. If you also notice Psalm 119, Psalm 119, verse 89, it says, Forever, O Lord, Your Word is settled in heaven. The Word of God is settled. It's the truth. It is a fixed reality. And it does not change over time with man's gain in knowledge or understanding of the universe. You know, science and what science declares changes over time. And what they believe to be true a hundred years ago or five hundred years ago or even twenty years ago is not what is true in their circles today. But what was true in God's Word a thousand, two thousand years ago is still true today. Forever, O Lord, Your Word is settled in the heaven. That's why in Psalm 119, 105 it says, Your Word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. We can rely on that Word to guide us, to show us the way, to help us to understand what is right, what is wrong, what is true, what is false. And that's why in verse 104 he says, Through your precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. We need to hate that error that people are espousing and hate that error that is creeping into the circle of God's people and causing them to compromise their faith. We have to reject everything that contradicts the Word of God. So as we look at this lesson on rock-solid faith, we're talking about creation compromises. Specific points about the creation, about what's recorded shortly thereafter, when it talks about the flood, when it talks about the Tower of Babel. We're going to go through these things and examine and see what does the Word of God say compared to what the skeptics, the atheists, and sadly compromising Christians have accepted. First of all, on the age of the earth, theistic evolutionists, and that really, I, I really even hate to put that up there because you, you can't be theistic and an evolution. It's a contradiction in terms. But that's how they're described because it's trying to say they believe in God, but they also believe in evolution, which ultimately is impossible. But be that as it may, Charles Darwin, who really popularized the idea of evolution and things developing over time and one species turning into another species and all of that, in his day in the 1800s, he said he believed the universe was 20 million years old because that's how much time was needed for all these changes to be affected and to go from the single cell blob to homo sapiens, to human beings. So he was saying 20 million years. Well, the current theory is the universe is 4.6 billion years old. So 4,600 million. Charles Darwin said 20 million. They're now saying 4,600 million which is 230 times what Darwin said. And if the world continues and people continue to believe that lie, it's going to get longer and longer because they have to keep stretching it out so that they have time for these changes to take place. Of course, they don't. The Bible, on the other hand, claims that the earth is young. Let's go to Luke chapter 3. Luke chapter 3. Now we're not going to read this list here, but I would like you to notice in Luke chapter 3 beginning in verse 23 down to verse 38 that it lists out the genealogy of Jesus Christ. And as you go down through here, one thing you're going to see is that from Christ to Abraham there's 55 men and from Abraham to Adam there's 20 men. And that makes sense, right? And these, we're going to talk about these time frames in a minute. But when you think about that, from Abraham back to Adam, there's fewer men because of longer lifespans. So, let's draw a fine point on this. From us back to Jesus is about 2,000 years, right? We say and declare this is the year 2021. And we get that 
because it's the 2021st year of our Lord. So, 2,000 years from us back to Jesus. Secular history agrees with that. There's no debating, there's no disputing that. From Jesus back to Abraham is about 2,000 years. There's no debating, no discussing that. Secular history agrees with it. Where the rub comes in is between Abraham back to Adam. And that, the Bible declares, is about 2,000 years as well. If you go back to the genealogies in Genesis chapter 5, and Genesis chapter 11, and we'll take just a peek here, Genesis chapter 5. Remember in Genesis 5, and you drop down to verse 3, it says, And Adam lived 130 years, begot a son in his own likeness after his image, and named him Seth. After he begot Seth, the days of Adam were 800 years and he had sons and daughters. So all the son days of Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. Seth lived 105 years, and begot Enosh. And you drop on down to verse 9. It says, Enosh lived 90 years, and begot Cain. In verse 12, Canaan lived 70 years, and begot Mahalalel. <laughs> but you go on down through there, and if you look at what's written, about how old the men were when they had their firstborn son. And you take that number. So with Adam and Seth, you take the 130. And then you add into that that Seth lived 105 years and Enosh was born. So Enosh was born 205 years after creation. Because Adam lived 130 years. And then 105 years later, Enosh was born. So that's 235 years, right? Is my math right? Okay, so you add those up, and from Adam down to Abraham is 1,948 years. So about 2,000 years. And if you look at what is written, as we cited a while ago, in Luke chapter 3, and it lists out that genealogy of Jesus Christ going all the way back to Adam. So from Jesus to Adam are 4,000 years, and from us to Jesus is 2,000. That's 6,000 years, give or take. That's how old the earth is. That's what the Bible declares. That the earth is young. It's not billions of years old. It's not even millions of years old. But it is thousands of years old. In Jude verse 14, you might just note this. In Jude, the book of Jude, in verse 14, it says, Now Enoch, the seventh from Adam. If you go back to Genesis 5 and you count those seven people, you, you count down from Adam, go. The seventh from Adam is Enoch. Enoch was born 662 years after creation. That's seven generations, 662 years. And so from Adam to Abram, 1,948 is not unreasonable or out of sync with what is recorded in Genesis 5, Genesis chapter 11, and so forth. The Bible declares the earth is young, very young. Now the Bible also declares, of course, the world was created and all things in it. The universe, the sun, the moon, the stars, all the planets created in six days. Again, you go back to Genesis chapter 1 and it talks about that the evening and the morning were the first day. And you keep on going in verse 8. It says the evening and the morning were the second day. You drop on down a little bit further. Verse 13, so the evening and the morning were the third day. And it keeps going and it talks about all these things created within six days. And you fast forward to Exodus chapter 20, verse 11. Exodus 20, verse 11, where the Lord is giving the Ten Commandments to the children of Israel. And where He establishes the Sabbath day as a day of rest. He explains why it is the seventh day is the day of rest. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. 
The earth was created in six days. Now, the evolutionary time frame says that the earth came into existence and life developed over millions and millions and millions of years. And the atheistic viewpoint is that six days of creation just could not happen. You could not get all this life in six days. And there are Christians who are trying to compromise and get the approval of and fit in with the atheistic, humanistic element in our society and say, well, God guided that over millions of years. And what you read about in Genesis chapter 1 is not literal days. But they're very long days, or there's a day and then there's this huge gap of time between day one and day two. There's millions of years. And so they'll say, well, that's stretched out over a very long period of time. They're trying to fit in. They're trying to compromise. But the Bible is very definite, very specific that the earth was created in six days. On the seventh, the Lord rested. By the way, that's why we have a week. Right? You can look at a year as the earth traveling around the sun. Right? A month is roughly the phase of the moon and how the moon acts. Right? Where does the week come from? Explain that. A week comes from Genesis chapter 1. That's where it comes from. But be that as it may, the earth being created in six days. And when they make this claim, well, the six days are figurative days. Well, what about the plants, the trees, the flowers, and all of that that needed bees? See, the plants were created on day three, but it's not until day five that you have the flying creatures. So how, how did those plants survive all that time. You see, that would be impossible. It just doesn't make sense. It would not work. Scientifically, by the way, it would not work. And then how do you explain Jesus talking about in Mark chapter 10, verse 6, how that the male and female, the man and woman, were there from the beginning of creation. Or in Romans chapter 1, notice this with me. Romans chapter 1. There's just a subtle mention of this in Romans chapter 1 and notice how it is put here. In Romans chapter 1 verse 18, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all unrighteousness and or ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness because what may be known of God is manifest in them for God has shown it to them for since the creation of the world his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse, because although they knew God, they did not glorify Him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes are clearly seen. Seen by whom? Who was there to see them? Well, the evolutionist, the theistic evolutionist, says nobody was there to see His invisible attributes from the creation. But it was millions of years later that they came on the scene and were able to witness God's existence through His invisible attributes by the things that are clearly seen. And then another question I have, if the six days of creation are figurative, can we say the same thing about Joshua and Israel and their attack on Jericho? Right? They marched around the city for six days. On the seventh day, they marched around seven times. Then they gave a shout, and the walls just fell down. But that never happens. That's, that's not the way a city is attacked. The way that a city is attacked is if they go up, they lay siege to it, and it usually lasts several months, 
and they build up these siege mounds and they get these battering rams and they go up and they, they bust out a, a piece of the wall and then they go in. Well, if they busted down all of them, well, then that must have taken a few years. Or, actually what happened was over hundreds of years, the elements, the wind, the rain, the freeze, the thaw, caused the walls to fall down and eventually they went in. See, if we can make the six days of creation figurative, can we not make anything figurative? Can we not just explain away every miracle in the Bible? And see, that's ultimately at the root of it and what the problem is. They're undermining the integrity and the authority of Scripture. But then also, think about this. That when it comes to the flood, it's claimed that the flood of Genesis chapter 7 was a local flood. Or it was just a complete myth. They say, well, there's not enough water on the earth. I mean, you stand here today and you, you look out at the oceans and you study geology and all of that. And there's just not enough water to cover the whole earth. I mean, Mount Everest, 20, what is it, 29,000 feet, something like that. There's no way that could ever be covered with water. There's not enough water out there in the oceans. And man was not over the whole earth. And so, you know, it's just, it's a made up story. You know, the Bible tells us that the flood was a universal flood. In Genesis chapter 7, Genesis chapter 7, just read with me if you would please, verses 17 and following here. It says, Now the flood was on the earth forty days. The waters increased and lifted up the ark, and it rose high above the earth. The waters prevailed and greatly increased on the earth. And the ark moved about on the surface of the waters, and the waters prevailed exceedingly on the earth, and all the high hills under the whole heaven were covered. The waters prevailed fifteen cubits upward, and the mountains were covered. And all flesh that moved on the earth, birds and cattle and beasts and creeping things, every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, and every man, all in whose nostril was the breath of the spirit of life, all that was on the dry land died. So he destroyed all living things that were on the face of the ground, both man and cattle, creeping thing and bird of the air. They were destroyed from the earth. Only Noah and those who were with him in the ark remained alive. And the waters prevailed on the earth 150 days. It says very plainly, very clearly, the entire earth was covered. Even the highest mountains were covered. Now, people who claim to believe in God, who claim to believe in the Bible, deny what we just read. Oh, it's just really talking about a local flood right there in the area. Well, go to Genesis chapter 9, verse 11 with me. Genesis 9, 11. This is after the flood waters have receded, after Noah and his family have come out of the ark. In Genesis 9, verse 11, thus, this is the Lord speaking, thus I will establish my covenant with you. Never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood. Never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. If it was a local flood, God broke His promise. Because there's been a lot of floods since Noah's day. A lot of floods that have taken a lot of lives. Whether it's the Mississippi that's flooded, or whether it's a tsunami or a tidal wave that comes up, and kills tens or hundreds of thousands of people. There's been a lot of that that has happened. But the Lord had made the promise, the flood that you just went through, what you just experienced, where all mankind was wiped out, I'm never going to do that again. And He hasn't done that again. The flood was a one-time miraculous event. It changed geology. It changed meteorology. In fact, if you go back to Genesis chapter 8, Genesis 8, the latter part of it there, Genesis 8, let's pick up in verse 20. It says, Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took of every clean animal and every clean bird and offered burnt offering on the altar. And the Lord smelled an aroma. Then the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground for man's sake, 
Although the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth, nor will I again destroy every living thing as I have done. Now here's the rub, verse 22. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, winter and summer, and day and night shall not cease. You see, before the flood, there was not the seed time and harvest, the cold and heat, the winter and summer. Before the flood, the Bible indicates it was a tropical world, a tropical environment. But now, and there was no rain before the flood. There was a mist that came up from the ground. But here he says, look, now after the flood, it's changed. There are going to be seasons. There is going to be winter and summer and cold and heat. And so, Meteorology changed along with geology, the actual face of the earth. And something else, if you notice it there, while the earth remains, cold heat, winter, summer shall not cease. Is there climate change? Yeah, there's climate change every single day. Did man create that? Did man do that? Does man affect that? No. No. It's impossible. We could not purposely change the climate. We couldn't do that. So, the Lord said, this is what's happening. And that's what we see to this very day. But it was different before the flood. And that's what the people who accept evolutionistic thinking don't understand. It was different. It was a miracle and things change after the flood. And if you go back into history, you study different cultures, there are over a hundred traditions recorded by ancient civilizations regarding the flood. Over a hundred. The ancient Babylonians had a flood story. The Chinese have a flood story. Hawaiians have a flood story. And if you go back, and we don't have time to do it today, but if you go back and you read those, it's like that's talking about Noah, and it's talking about God, and talking about judgment, it's talking about the ark. The question is, why are all those different flood stories out there? Well, because it happened. Because it happened. The Bible records the true account of it, the others have the things that were passed down through the years and then their own interpretations put on. That's what we have. There's abundant geological evidence for a universal flood. I'm just going to step through these very brief, briefly. This is from AnswersInGenesis.org. There are fossils of sea creatures high above sea level due to the ocean waters having flooded over the continents. We've all seen seashells and stuff and rocks and in the ground and dirt and stuff where they shouldn't be because there's no ocean there now. But it's there because there were waters over the whole earth at one point. There is evidence of the rapid burial of plants and animals, rapidly deposit sediment layers spread across great areas. So if you have ever seen the White Cliffs of Dover, the southern part of Great Britain, that soil that makes up those white cliffs goes across the English Channel, into France, across Europe, down into the Middle East. How did that happen? Well, it's because there was a flood and it all settled in there. There is sediment that's been transported long distances. They've been able to track that down. There's no erosion or very little erosion between strata, between the layers that have been laid down. You know, you look at the Grand Canyon, you see all those stripes in the soil. And they're very thin, very definite lines. That means there's one layer. And then another one comes in right on top of it. And another one settles in right on top. And another on top of that. That's what that's showing. That, that's a result of a flood. The worldwide flood. So there is abundant and overwhelming evidence that echoes what we read about, what is declared and confirmed in the Word of God. You know, there are so-called, again, believers that look at Genesis chapters 1 through 11 and they say, all of that's mythical. All of that is made up. There's no real Adam and Eve. There's no serpent that was in the garden that spoke to Eve. Uh, that's just a, a story that's made up to explain things 
Uh, there's no universal flood, as we talked about. There's no Tower of Babel. None of that ever happened. It's just the Hebrews' way of explaining the way they found the world when they were in the world and how the world got there. So it's all just a myth. And there are Christians now, understand this, there are Christians who say it's not real. It's just an allegory. It's just a story that they made up. Well, you know who did believe in all these things? Jesus and the apostles. When you look at Matthew chapter 19, Matthew chapter 19, I want to step through these just to reinforce this in our understanding. Matthew chapter 19, verse 4, He says, Have you not read that He who made them at the beginning made them male and female? What's that talking about? Genesis 1, 26, 27. Genesis chapter 2, God made Adam and God made Eve. And He said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. What's that? That's Genesis chapter 2, 24. So they, so then they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore what God has joined together, let not man separate. The Lord declared His belief in Adam and Eve and their creation by God and bringing them together as husband and wife. Then again in Matthew chapter 24. Matthew 24. When the Lord is talking about the final judgment in Matthew 24, verse 37, He says, But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark, and did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. See, He mentions Noah, He mentions the ark, He talks about the flood. The Lord believed in that. So are we going to come along and deny that that happened? The so Lord, you, you don't know what you're talking about. In 1 Peter chapter 3, 1 Peter 3, I think we are relatively familiar with 1 Peter 3, 20 and 21. Who formerly were disobedient when once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight souls, were saved through water, there is also an antitype which now saves us, baptism, not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You see how Peter declares his belief in it? There was divine long-suffering while the ark was being prepared in the days of Noah, he believed in Noah that he was a historical figure. He believed what Noah did in history in building that ark. He believed the reason why Noah had to build that ark because there was a judgment that was coming, but God gave time for Noah to build that ark and to preach to the people that they may repent. In Romans chapter 5, Romans chapter 5, the Apostle Paul makes mention of Adam in verse 14. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses. See, as much as he believed Moses was a historical figure, he believed Adam was a historical figure. And then 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. He spoke about Adam again in 1 Timothy chapter 2. Let's skip over to there. 1 Timothy chapter 2. Remember what he says here, 1 Timothy 2, verses 11 and following. Let a woman learn in silence with all submission, and I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over man, but to be in silence. Why? For Adam was first formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. Nevertheless, she will be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith and love, holiness with self-control. Adam, Eve. Eve deceived, not Adam. So he says they're historical figures and he believed in what happened in the garden. In fact, if you jump to 2 Corinthians chapter 11, 2 Corinthians 11 verse 3, he says, But I fear lest somehow as the serpent deceived Eve find his craftiness. He believed in that serpent in what's recorded in Genesis chapter 3. The serpent spoke to her and deceived her. 
He talks about the man was not made for the woman, but the woman for man. 1 Corinthians 11, 8 and 9. And then 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6. For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So here's the choice before us. We can either go along with people who deny the reality of God's Word, or we can agree with Jesus, with Peter, with Paul. Now here's the thing. I want us to understand this. There are people who say, well, Genesis 1 through 11, and what you believe on that is not a salvation issue. It's a lie. It is a salvation issue. Because if you deny what the Lord and His apostles clearly stated was real, was truth, then you are blaspheming God. It is a salvation issue. If we deny the first 11 chapters of the Word of God and say it's a myth, why should we listen to any of the Word of God? Why should we accept it? Why should we believe anything if we don't believe the very origins of our existence? Then why believe anything the Word of God says? If you will, open to number 813. 813. <laughs> Compromise on creation is fundamentally abandoning the faith. Some believers have accepted compromise and it's to their shame. And when they accept that compromise and they claim to be believers in the Word of God, they are undermining the validity and the authority of Scripture and they're provoking God to wrath. We need to be people who are determined to stand firm. We need to be people who put our faith in the Word of God. Let that faith be rooted in that Word that is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Rooted in that Word that Romans 1.16 says is the power of God unto salvation. If you are one who believes in the Word of God, you're convicted in it. You need to take a stand against that atheistic humanistic viewpoint. No matter how much pressure is brought to bear against you, no matter how much they want you to feel ashamed and embarrassed, don't be ashamed, don't be embarrassed of what the Word of God declares. If you've compromised, then you need to repent. You need to seek the Lord's mercy and forgiveness. If you've fallen into sin in some other way, whether it's immorality or other ways that you've turned your back on God, won't you repent of that this morning? He's merciful. We've seen, we talked about the flood, that He judges people, but He also extends mercy. And while He extends His mercy to you now, won't you return to Him? If you've never obeyed the Gospel, but realize today that you need to obey that Gospel, then won't you do as Peter declared, that you would be baptized to have your sins washed away? You can stand afresh, anew, before God. If you believe in His Son, you're willing to confess Him, you're willing to turn away from your sins, we will immerse you that your sins may be forgiven and you may look forward to that home in heaven. If you need to respond, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.